all of these systems working together brings us to the last of the Pollyanna principles. And that is that individuals will go where systems lead them. Typically, when things start to fall apart and everybody's blaming everybody else, that's an indication that the system is failing, not those individuals failing. If boards everywhere around the world, and I talk to them and so I know, if boards everywhere around the world are candidates for board development, if boards everywhere around the world are the equivalent of the Consultants Full Employment Act, then it's not that we are genetically predisposed to be bad board members. There is a system that isn't working. If planning is focusing us on what's right in front of us instead of what's down the road, that's a system that isn't working. And if resource development requires us to compete and then complains that we do, that's a system that's not working. In, when we are out in communities and we travel all over the world, and when we're in communities, we offer the funders in those communities, would you like us to convene the funders around a conversation, just like this, to talk about, you're already investing millions of dollars in your community, what is stopping those dollars from creating more change? And eventually those funders get around to the same thing we hear all the time. There's so many nonprofits in our community and they're all competing with each other. And so we look at those funders and we ask them, do you have a competitive grant process? Some of them get it when I'm asking the question. Some of them don't. They say, of course we do. To which we say, well, why do you think they're competing? We have created the systems and then we complain that the system is actually working quite well. So if, in fact, individuals will go where systems lead them, what does that make possible? We can create new systems. We can create new systems. We can create governance systems that aim boards at the results they want to see in their communities, not just in two years, but in 10 years and 50 years and 100 years. We can create planning systems that aim us in that direction. We can create funding and resource development and resource sharing systems that allow us and encourage us and inspire us to work cooperatively rather than screaming and yelling that we don't when in fact we're told we shouldn't. We can create the systems, we can be the change we want to see. And that's what the Pollyanna principles are all about. We can create systems based on our fears or we can create systems based on inspiration. We can create systems based on the things that we know are not possible. Or we can create systems based on the fact that pretty much anything is possible. And so in closing, I want to share with you one of my mentors and role models. And this is, is the gentleman to whom I was the first dedication in the book as you open the book. And that is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And when we think about Reverend King and we think about the Pollyanna principles, did he focus on the interconnectedness of everyone? Did he use means that created a raging river out of everyone together? Of course he did. Was he being the change he wanted to see? Was he walking his talk? If nonviolence is evidence of anything, it is evidence of someone who said, I will not sink so low as to use the very methods that have been used to oppress us. Did he see strengths in a people that everybody said have no strength? Yeah. And did he create systems that would outlive him, that would remain in place? Yes, he did. But it wasn't just the means. He held himself personally accountable for being the change, for creating the future he wanted to see. If the I have a dream speech is anything, it is a speech about creating the future. Now, I share with you all of this about the Reverend King. I need to share something else about the Reverend King. He is a horrible role model. He's a horrible role model. One reason, none of us think we can be him. We think of Reverend King, we think of Mahatma Gandhi, and we think they're gods. 
you know, but that was Dr. King. I could never be like that. So I want to share a different role model with you. I want to share with you the role model of Rick Carter. Rick Carter is head of the Human Service Federation in the Midwest town of Lincoln, Nebraska. You guys think you could maybe be Rick Carter who heads the Human Services Federation? Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Let me tell you what Rick did. As the head of the Human Services Federation, Rick was asked, let me take my glasses off because there's just a smidge of glare out there. Rick was asked, as most of us are when you're in, if you head a coalition then you've been asked, to please facilitate a plan. Please facilitate a strategic plan for one of the members of the Human, Fed Human Services Federation. This organization happened to be Nebraskans against the death penalty. And so Rick said, sure, I'd be happy to. And in facilitating this plan, the first thing he said is, okay, well, what have you been doing? Well, like most advocacy groups that are sort of out of favor with the legislature, they were doing what you'll recognize. They were waiting. They were waiting for the legis legislature to change, to become more favorable. They were writing letters to the editor. They were writing editorials in the local paper. They were holding rallies and vigils. They were protesting. And so Rick said, okay, well, let's define for Nebraskans against the death penalty. What would success look like? And they said, well, we'd abolish the death penalty. He said, all right, that's what we're hanging our plan on. We're going to aim at that, and we're going to work our way backwards to see what happens. This was in 2006. This was actually in the middle of 2006. And when Nebraskans Against the Death Penalty entered the 2006 legislative session in Nebraska, they could count six votes out of the 49 in the legislature. They weren't going anywhere. They weren't even going to get a floor discussion, forget getting a floor vote. And they certainly weren't going to win anything. By the end of that 2006 legislative session, few months later, they not only got a floor discussion, they got a floor vote. And I wish I could tell you that on this first time out of the shoot, they won. But they lost 25 to 24. But the story's not over. And the story's not over because as exciting as that was to me, and I tell you, I still get chills when I think that that happens so fast. The reason it happens fast is we take the blinders off and we aim at it. But here's what happened after that. Several months later, I'm reading the New York Times and I pick it up and I go, oh my goodness. And the first thing I do is pick up the phone and I called Rick and I said, tell me what happened. What happened was that Nebraskans Against the Death Penalty also looked at the courts. They knew that there's the legislature and there's the courts. And because there was only one form of legal capital punishment in Nebraska, the electric chair, they had a judge that ruled that the electric chair is cruel and unusual punishment and was unconstitutional. And within 12 to 18 months of doing that plan, Nebraskans against the death penalty eliminated the death penalty in the state of Nebraska. What we think is impossible is not impossible. Unless something is scientifically impossible, it is possible. It may not be likely. It may not be right around the corner in our minds. It may be improbable. But a hundred years ago, putting a man on the moon weren't going to happen. Two hundred years ago, if someone had said an African American will be president of the United States of America, we'd say, that's impossible. It's not impossible. Creating visionary change in our communities is not only possible, it is practical and it is doable. And the only thing left for us to do is to get to work. So thank you and I look forward to the rest of the day.